Hello, and welcome to the Silicon Alley Podcast. I'm your host, William Glass, and today I am sitting down with Nick Milanovic, and we are talking all things fintech. If you're not familiar with Nick, he's the founder of This Week in Fintech, which is an incredible newsletter that focuses on, you guessed it, fintech. Uh, It's got over 10,000 subscribers. They do global events and really does a great job of capturing all the activity and interesting things that are going on in the fintech space. What's really exciting is that Nick has been in the early stage startup side of fintech. He's worked at Google on their Google Pay products. So he's worked both at a large company, he's worked at startups, and he is now starting his own venture fund that is focused on investing in early stage fintech called the fintech fund, who knew? Um, (laughs) But we go really deep into his journey, some of the things that they're really focused on, what he thinks is going to set apart this new venture fund. Um, He's actually been doing syndicate and doing investing for the last at least 18 months or so, and is essentially building off of the success of that first 18 months. So we go really deep. It's great if you're in the fintech space, you want to get caught up on what's going on, you're an early stage founder that's trying to understand how to raise money. And it's just a really fun conversation. So I hope you enjoy today's episode of the Silicon Alley podcast featuring the Nick Milanovic. Are you interested in growing and scaling your business? Welcome to the Silicon Alley podcast, where you'll hear from entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and top performers on what it truly takes to grow and scale a business. You'll walk away with actionable insights you can apply in your own business and life. Now to William Glass, the CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and your host of the Silicon Alley podcast. Nick, welcome to the Silicon Alley Podcast. Super excited to have you on today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited we finally get to talk. I know, I know. Yeah, we've had this on the calendar for a little while now and had to, had to reschedule one because I had bad internet issues. So I appreciate your uh, you know, powering through and bearing with, with the, uh, the snafus. Definitely, yeah. We're, we're all at the whims of our Wi-Fi today. So fingers crossed that it all go well. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Well, awesome, Nick. I definitely want to, um, there's a lot of things I want to cover. Really want to understand kind of your journey in fintech. You've been in it for over a decade. You've got this week in fintech, which you started, which is this awesome newsletter. If, and if for folks that aren't aware, if you're not subscribed, you definitely should, um, which covers a lot of really great information of what's happened um, in fintech over the week. And, uh, but you've actually got this new venture that I think is really exciting to talk about. So can you talk to me a little about the um, FinTech fund and what is what this is all about and why you are um, building this uh, venture fund? Yeah, the, the very creatively named the FinTech fund. <laughs> uh, uh, well, first, thank you so much for having me. I, I've been a fan uh, in, the, in the wings of Silicon Alley for a while. And so I, I really admire everything you've built with the podcast. Um, uh, I'm excited. Today is actually the official launch. We're coming out of the stealth of the fintech fund, so this is something you know near and dear to my heart that I've been you know working on in the background for about seven months now, and it's exciting to finally see it go live. Um, but the idea is that um, you know over the last two and a half years, we've developed such a remarkable community with this week in fintech um, and with our events, uh, and not just in the U.S. but internationally um, that. Uh, you know, kind of the, the number one request from people who reach out to us was um, we're looking for more great angel investors to back our uh, early startup. And we want to really connect with people who know FinTech deeply and can help us out. Um, and so, you know, this is a request that I've been getting for two and a half years. And, um, you know, in the back of my mind, I was like, I know these people. These people are all, you know, newsletter readers and subscribers and people I meet at our events. Um, there's so many smart people in the space and they all want to give back too. They want to support emerging founders. And so the fund is a little bit different from a traditional venture fund in that it's really a way to connect those two groups of people together. Um, we take the people who have been working in FinTech for a long time and have so much domain experience here. Um, and they're all of our LPs and, uh, you know, add up their capital to reinvest in early stage FinTech founders and, uh, support them you know, at the first part of their journey outside of just writing the check. Yeah, that's awesome, Nick. No, and I, yeah, it, it, it may, yeah, it may not have been the most creatively named, but at least there's no doubt about what the focus is, right? So um, I, I love that. And I think you're spot on, right? Because one of the biggest challenges is not just raising capital, but it's having that expertise, someone that might not be from the fintech industry that's starting a company and, you know, has a unique vision, a unique approach, sees an opportunity, but doesn't have the expertise of how to navigate 
regulatory environment or how, how do you acquire users or whatever the challenges are um, that are specific and unique to fintech. So I really like that focus. So did you come at, so you were saying people were asking for this um, or was it like, was it fintech folks that were in fact fintech that wanted to invest in other fintech companies or more so startups that were looking for capital and you saw this opportunity? What was the connection point of what actually led you to, to make the jump? Yeah, I mean, it's, that, that's, you know, exactly the right question. And, and let me talk a little bit about the genesis of the fund because it didn't just come out of nowhere. Um, so I've been writing the newsletter for about uh, two and a half years, and I had like two sets of people coming to me pretty consistently. Uh, on the one hand, were uh, early stage founders um, who were saying, look, I'm looking for more angels to join, you know, this pre-seed or the seed round so I can get people who understand fintech around the table with me to help. Um, on the other hand, were people um, who had been working in fintech for a long time, um, and you know they might have built their own companies, they might have exited with the companies that they were at, and you know what they said is, you know, I have some money now that I'd like to reinvest in startups, and I want to put it into fintech because that's the space that I know best. Can you connect me with early stage founders who are looking for angels to support them? So uh, about 18 months ago, I started uh, an angel investment syndicate. Um, it was pretty private. We weren't on AngelList or anything um, because we wanted to keep the membership pretty tight to people who were just deeply in the fintech community. Um, and so we've grown to about 120 members in those 18 months. We've put money into over 40 companies. Um, and what I consistently hear from founders is, um, thank you so much for connecting me with like, you know, these two people who put money into the SPV. Like I've been on a call with them every week and they've been so instrumental in like helping me think through like our scaling strategy or, um, you know, uh, our product development or how we select between two different vendors. Um, so at the one year mark, I took a look at the syndicate and I said, all right, what's going well, what's not going well? Let's like postmortem this and understand where we can be doing better. Um, so what I felt really strong about was putting a great group of people in the syndicate to, to co-invest in companies. Um, and really getting connected to great founders um, who I and the rest of the group really believed in and, and backing startups in like really competitive deals that were shutting out like brand name VCs. What wasn't, you know, going as great was a founder would come to me and say, hey, I'd love to get your syndicate involved. You know, here's $200,000 in allocation in our pre-seed. And I would say, okay, great. Well, hang on two weeks. Let me see, you know, what the interest level looks like. And then two weeks later, I come back and say like, we're really interested in joining, but, you know, everybody's writing checks out of their pocketbooks so we can only cut a check for $50,000. And so, you know, I said, that's not a great experience for founders. Um, they want predictability and they want to just be able to know like what their cap table composition is going to look like up front. So the fund is really um, kind of the next step in that investing journey. And so some of the things that I've deliberately done is if you look at the fund website um, at the fintechfund.com, um, the LPs are all fintech people. And so I still want to bring this like experienced group to, to back and support fintech founders. But having a fixed capital vehicle will allow me to just say, like on day one, like, love your company. Um, you know, we can commit to the $200,000 in allocation up front. Um, and we're, we're going to bring a really good group to support you, um, you know, on your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, no, I love that. And that makes sense, right? Being able to have that predictability. And if you're only able to fill out a certain portion of the round, but, you know, you're being able to, you're getting these opportunities that, as you said, are, are shutting out brand name VCs presents a, a huge opportunity. And I can say, you know, as a fintech founder, that's a lot more appealing, right? To have other folks that are, you know, have experience in the industry that can, you know, really talk through some of the challenges that are unique as a, as a fintech company and a fintech founder that you're going to face. Um, and the value prop makes a lot of sense. And so, you know, you've said the focus is really on that pre-seed and seed stage, that early stage. Yeah, yeah. And, and the reason for that is that I think as a founder, that's probably where you, you really benefit the most from external support. If you make it, you know, every company is different, but if you make it to your series A, series B, series C, of course, there's still a lot of risk and there's a lot of uncertainty, but by then you've probably put the right group of people around the table from you in your investor base, in your advisors and in your hires. Um, and so like the marginal ad of like, you know, another angel who understands fintech isn't as high as it is, but like, I call those first two years, the valley of death, because like, that's really where like, you're just fending off one existential threat after another. I, I wouldn't say this like in an armchair way, like I was the, the first hire over at funding circle and then part of the early team over at pedal. 
And like those first 18 months of a company are terrifying and you're, you know, uh, navigating a ton of uncertainty and ambiguity. You like have to consistently pivot and stay very nimble and you have to be like very willing to like disassociate from like whatever prior convictions you have when you get new data that informs your product strategy. Um, so I think it's super helpful to talk to people who can say, don't worry, like we've been down this road before. We know exactly, you know, which vendor you want to support you here, how to negotiate this contract there, what kind of hire you should be looking for to scale your team. Um, I, I think founders just kind of need that uh, that kind of sounding board. But, you know, I, I'd actually turn that back to you. Like, in starting Ostrich, like, you know, what did you think of as a first, as, as, a, as a founder? And, you know, what was your experience like for those first couple of years? Yeah, I mean, we're still figuring things out, um, right? I think, as you said, it's, it's the valley of death is a great, uh, a great analogy, right? Every day, there's something new that you've got to figure out. And for us, you know, we up until this month hadn't raised any capital. So we've been running very much a bootstrapped lean organization. So the way that we approach problems with the team and skill set was a little different. We had to get creative on negotiating contracts so we could bring in engineering talent without being able to support, you know, full-time salaries. And so I think that like, there's a lot of things that you don't think about um, at least starting because that's not something that I would have thought that I would need to figure out when we were first starting the company just knew that there was an opportunity in you know, the personal finance space that wasn't being addressed and everyone was kind of taking the same approach. And so that's been you know, the learnings is that there's all these other things that you just don't think about that you've got to you know, navigate. And like for us, I know we ended up um, connecting with John Zanoff, who I'm sure you're familiar with at Empire Startups, who's big in the, you know, the FinTech space. And he's been really helpful on our journey and connecting us with different people. And it's been, the fact that we've been able to connect and learn from other folks that we've been able to get to where we are today. Um, so it's definitely a huge need and something that I wish we would have had more advisors and support even earlier on. Um, cause it definitely would have sped up what we did. We would have avoided a lot of the pitfalls and mistakes that we've made along the way, building the wrong thing, um, stuff like that. So it's definitely, definitely a huge need. Yeah. John is, John's phenomenal. He, uh, he actually speaks very highly of you and your team and um he's a he's a we work on a couple of things together and he's a you know talk about like a fintech og you know he he knows his space better than most he does yeah yeah he's he's a great guy so what so if you're so if you're thinking about like the unique you've, you've talked about it right having that support of fintech um alums that have had experience founders early you know folks that have worked in early stage fintech companies that really understand how to navigate what would you say to someone that is in fintech that might be raising capital that is looking for you know to to find the right fit partner like what advice would you give from that lens having sat in this space now from an investment lens obviously going through it from your prior experience being an early stage fintech and then obviously from all of the exposure that you get through the newsletter i'm curious what advice you have for early stage founders um Man, that's such a good question. And I have to say, like, this is a little bit of a cop out answer, but um, fintech today is like really different from like uh, fintech as a term. 10 years ago, I think in the first phase of fintech development, it was really products were kind of centralized around um, consumer facing financial technology because that was the most obvious uh, vector for improving on the user experience. And so fintech 1.0 was um, you know the wealth fronts and betterments of the world in the robo advisor space, uh, the funding circles, lending clubs, and prosperous the world in peer to peer lending, um, you know platforms like Robinhood disrupting investing and, and Venmo disrupting payments, all consumer facing. And the reason I bring this up is because today fintech looks very different. You have all these different verticals, um, KYC, AML companies, uh, you know compliance management companies. B2B payments companies, um, you know, interbank, uh, you know, derivatives management companies. Um, and so this is kind of a roundabout way of saying uh, fintech as a category is so broad now that there's not really like great one size fits all um, advice specific to fintech. Like I, I can great, give great maybe early stage founder advice, but uh, depending on what kind of fintech company you're starting, there's going to be a lot of different best practices that benefit you. Um, but the, the one thing I'll say is um, fintech is an incredibly regulated space and there are uh, very strong reasons for that regulation to be in place. Um, and it is a space that requires building a lot of um, 
architecture that has been developed over the course of decades um, and familiarity with that architecture will really be a competitive advantage to you depending on what space you're in. Like familiarity with uh, ACH settlement, for instance, if you're creating a, a peer peer payments company. And so in those two spaces, like understanding infrastructure and understanding regulation, like you can really do well by staffing yourself up with people who understand, um, you know, what the paradigm is and who are comfortable taking an appropriate level of risk. If you, you know, dot every I and cross every T, um, the reality is um, you may move more slowly than you had hoped or anticipated to grow as a startup. If you take too much risk, um, you're going to make mistakes. And, and when you're managing money, like you should really have a zero tolerance for mistakes, period. Uh, you should never mismanage the money of any user. Um, and so you need to find the appropriate uh, risk aperture that allows you to grow quickly, uh, but also grow thoughtfully and make sure that you're always doing right by every counterparty that you're working with. Um, and it's, you know, it might sound like a little bit like of a, you know, truism, but it's a tough balance to find. And, 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 you know, for an early stage team, you know, it's really difficult to decide, like, how do we shake things up and move fast without breaking things? Yeah, no, I think that's a great, yeah, great perspective, Nick. And obviously, as you said early on, right, it's going to depend on what sector of fintech, because it's so broad now as to, you know, best practices. But um, to your point, like, yeah, you can't, you can't mess with other people's money. It's a very quick way to lose customers and essentially go to zero, um, right. Is mismanagement. I mean, even think about like, you know, and, and, you know, Robin hood, wherever your take is on it, but even the perception of what happened where they're not able to allow folks to trade during the meme stock craze last year, right. Because of the capital restraint constraints, and they didn't do a great job communicating as to why they had to halt trading on those, you know, Ultimately, it seems like it hasn't really hurt them, but it did, you know, for for at least a short time period, um, affect their, you know, their their customer experience and kind of their ability to to uh, bring on new customers and kind of that experience that they really landed with early on. So those first users. So it definitely is absolutely key to get that right. Yeah, I mean, if you're a fintech company, your number one currency is not dollars or pounds or euros it is user trust and if you abuse user trust once like there's a very good chance that you may not get that currency back and so trust and reputation are the strongest things you can build for yourself yeah i'm it's, sure you feel I mean, that way at ostrich oh 100 i mean we've we've made a lot of decisions around the product one because of constraints but also because we think it's a better approach to stay away from touching people's money um we think there's a better way to help people achieve financial goals and part of that's been one, we know that regulation is really tough. Building trust is really tough. And, you know, depending on the customer segment you're going after, there can be some natural hesitancy to trust financial services companies to begin with. So um, it's kind of a back, back-ended way approach of getting into financial services to actually not focus on them has been kind of our thought. But it's great to, you know, to your point, um, if we can help people actually make progress towards their goals from a consumer perspective versus just providing another bank account or another cool service automation tool, then that can be what really sets us apart from a trust perspective. So that's how we viewed it as well. And um, kind of aligns with what you're saying of really focusing on that piece first and foremost. Yeah, hundred percent. So Nick, I'm curious, how's it been building a fund, right? You are now, you know, managing managing a fund yourself right so what's been kind of your process learnings as you've been out fundraising um and you know thinking through how you are going to help allocate capital through this new fund as a as a fund manager for the first time you know like doing anything for the first time there's a lot of existential dread um because the stakes are extremely high and when it comes to managing other people's money um, you know, there's really nothing that I've ever taken more seriously. Like there's an incredibly high standard that I have to hold myself to. Um, I am really lucky that I found a great team to work with a couple of years ago, um, in the form of this company called Sidecar. It's a S Y D E C A R. Um, they're an emerging, uh, competitor to angel list, but their real bread and butter is in structuring syndicates and SPVs and funds. Um, and so their platform abstracts away a lot of the tax accounting, auditing, reporting, legal, um, with kind of an out of the box platform for investing in LP management. Um, and so that's made the process just 
way better for me than kind of doing this by hand with a legal team. Um, so I'm very lucky in that. Um, but, you know, when I think about the fun strategy, uh, you know, rather than like the fun admin and new things, um, what's important to me is that I'm building something that is really differentiated, that is truly unique. Uh, you probably know as well as I do, there's been a, a flood of capital um, into early stage tech over the last two to three years, even more so than, you know, over the last 10 or 15. Um, traditional funds have raised, you know, mega rounds and have big war chests with a lot of dry powder now. There are a lot of new entrants to the market and that means new funds as well. Um, and so we're operating in a different venture ecosystem now than we were even just a couple of years ago before the pandemic. Um, and so you have a lot of new entrants who are early stage fintech VCs. Um, and I know a lot of these emerging managers. They're people um, who I respect deeply, who I collaborate with a lot. They're really smart. Um, and so what I want to make sure that I'm doing is building something that actually provides value that, you know, doesn't exist elsewhere in the market, not just like another check, um, you know, pursuing uh, buzzy founders. Um, and so that's really why, um, you know, the newsletter and the events that we host in person and the composition of the LPs all being from the fintech space is really central to our strategy. Um, you know, our, our fund is going to be capped at $10 million. The average check size is going to be one hundred fifty to $200,000. Where that'll end up in 18 months is with us writing checks to between 25 and 40 companies, preserving a little bit of money from follow on. So that's the fund strategy. But a $200,000 check is not going to be differentiated. What is, is that, you know, when we write the check, um, as a founder, you immediately get access to all these people who can be instrumental in the growth and development of your company. And I think that that's way more important. Um, you know, we give founders free access to our job board for any uh, hires that they want to make and, and list there. Um, you know, we help them get their news out through the newsletter and on our social media channels and, uh, you know, help them meet people in person at our events. Um, and so, like the common thread that you can probably see here is everything's about community connections uh, and the fund is no different. And I really think that um, unlike the traditional venture model where you have sharp elbowed firms that are like pushing out other investors, trying to maximize their allocation and you know have full control of the board and get as much ownership as possible. Like I think that that model is dying out a little bit at the early stage. And what you're finding in its place is way better. It's these collaborative funds like this one that are like, let's put as many great people around the table as we can, because that's really going to de-risk the fund, the, the company that we're investing in, help founders out. And these community connections, I think, ultimately are going to build stronger companies. Yeah. No, Nick, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I want to zone in, uh, zoom in on that specifically, the community aspect. Because, you know, when I look at other, you know, VCs, a lot of times their support is maybe they'll write a Medium article or they'll just continue to retweet whatever, you know, portfolio company puts out. And that's kind of like their, their community support. Um, and I think that's really interesting being able to leverage what you've built within the fintech community, right? Newsletter, social media, things like that, that you've done that can help, um, you know, support companies that you invest in. I'm obviously assuming that you're not going to be pumping everything out, right? There's still some, some editorial, uh, uh, discretion that's going to, that's going to take place, right. Based on for this week in FinTech that the way it will remain, you know, what it's done, but that's, I think a key point that does differentiate and something that stands out to me is the fact that you've already built a community that's in this space where you've actually got deep connections to resources versus, um, you know, necessarily being started by folks that had exited the company and have, you know, some network, but you've legitimately built a community that goes beyond just your own experiences and the companies that you've worked at. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really exciting to see FinTech like developing as its own community. And we have like, uh, we have over 10,000 readers now and they're international. Um, and I, I think it's important to add a, a, a big caveat here that um, the newsletter is focused on reporting the news. It's not focused on self-promotion. And so what we uh, make sure that we do with all of this is um, we add with an asterisk we, we've added asterisk to denote any company in which we have an interest, whether we work at that company, have worked at that company or are invest in that company, uh, because editorial independence is really important in the newsletter. So we don't want to become a mouthpiece for the portfolio companies we invest in, but we do want to help them get the news out. Um, and you know, this wouldn't have been possible and I need to provide a little spotlight for them without our great international editors in chief. Um, so that's been the most exciting part for me, I think is uh, Christine Chang, who's a VC in Mexico City, 
um, has been heading up the newsletter and all of our events in Latin America. Uh, Michael Jenkins, who uh, works at Fidel over at London, has been heading up our UK and Europe edition. Uh, and Osborne Saldana, who's a VC over in Bangalore, has been heading up our uh, India and Southeast Asia edition. So I will put a call out here. We're in the market for a great uh, Africa editor and a great Middle East FinTech editor. Um, but uh, I think what's been most exciting over the last couple of years is FinTech was kind of a mostly US European product category. And now you have these amazing hubs being developed in Mexico City, in Lagos, in you know, Karachi, in Cape Town, um, in, in Sao Paulo, where you have these huge FinTech ecosystems with a ton of innovation that you haven't even seen in the US and Europe developing. And so I'm really hoping that we can dig more into there in the next couple of years. Yeah, no, thanks for, yeah, thanks for highlighting that, Nick. I think um, I was listening to a podcast that you did, I think in September, it was released in September of last year, where you were touching a little bit on how a lot of the um, uh, innovation isn't necessarily happening in the US and Europe, it's happening in some of these other uh, markets like LATAM and Africa and Asia, where the regulations are different and also the needs, right? I think you touched a little bit on how how some of the inf payment infrastructure had skipped generations because, um, right, like, and you think about like in China with WeChat and um, Alipay, right, how you're able to just, everything's integrated, there's no cash there at all. So there's definitely opportunity, I think, that's happening internationally. And I'm, I'm curious how you were able to to build that up, right? You started the newsletter two and a half years ago. How, do, how are you able to build up the community? Because I think that's a really key thing that I'd love to zoom in on. Uh, I'm just extremely online. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a lot of Twitter activity. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I say that half joking, but honestly, it's half serious. Twitter has been like an incredible way to connect with other people who are passionate about FinTech. Um, and so we started hosting these events about nine months ago and it began in New York. But now we've hosted events in New York, SF, LA, and then uh, a couple other US cities, but in Mexico City, in London, in Lagos. Um, I'm actually going you know, next month to uh, an event that we're hosting in Nairobi, and then another one that we're hosting in Cape Town. Uh, and the month after that, one they're hosting in Bogota, in Colombia. Um, and it's been so energizing to see these in-person communities come together around the events. And it would not be possible without our two just incredible community leads, Christina Siravalli, who works at Plaid for her day job, and Katie Harper, who's the uh, COO over at Card, um, who helped us pull these events together and organize everything uh, for the FinTech community, which last year ended with the, um, and, and I got to send you a ticket for this next year, the FinTech formal that we hosted in New York. It was a uh, 500 person black tie gala that we hosted at the boathouse in Central Park and we raised uh, $20,000 for charity. Um, and so, you know, that's gonna, be see, that's gonna be something that you see us try and do a lot with our events in the next year as well is every event should be raising money for a local charity and, or nonprofit, especially those that support, um, you know, financial initiatives. Um, so, you know, there's a mix of online and offline communities coming together here and we try to be very light footprint and everything we do instead of uh, making everything CapEx heavy. But uh, I, I hope that, you know, with the fund, we'll just be able to grow that. Yeah, no, I love that. So yeah, so key is be very active on Twitter. And it sounds like engaging other people in the FinTech space is a, is a key component of, of uh, building that community and that network. Yeah, yeah. My girlfriend rolls her eyes when she sees me check Twitter at this point. She's like, oh God, he's at it again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, just can't can't get you off Twitter. I'm curious, Nick. We haven't touched on this piece yet. Obviously, Web three, DeFi, crypto has really kind of come to the forefront over the last you know 18 months or so. I'd say um, obviously been around for a lot longer than that, but really we've seen a lot of interest, and you've now seen a lot of folks that are have built big companies that are really focused on this. I'm curious what your thoughts are, and I'm not asking you to make any predictions, but just, you know, you've, if you're starting to see a proliferation between kind of traditional FinTech and Web3, there seems to be a little bit of an overlap, but there also seems to be a little bit of like butting heads. I'm just curious what your perspective is on kind of this emerging area within, uh, within the community. No, it, it's all right. I'm comfortable making predictions and some of these will fall flat on their face and some of them, you know, may pan out. We'll see. So I, just like every other, you know, uh, thought person on Twitter, I put out like a long tweet of 
predictions for the next couple of years in fintech in December. Um, but you know, Web3 and DeFi has been the center of the conversation in a lot of fintech circles for the last year. A few years ago in 2019, I grabbed a beer with uh, Brandon, who's the COO over at Dharma, and I was just so blown away by the product vision. Um, Dharma was at the time building smart contracts to manage every type of loan. Um, and I, you know, had this light bulb moment where I was like, this is definitely the future of financial technology is if you can, uh, have programmable digital money that allows you to build into the use case of that money, you know, what the contract terms are, it is going to make, uh, traditional financial services look archaic very shortly. Um, and so like, you know, you can have like a peer to peer transfer that's automatically held in escrow until certain external conditions are met and there's no question about how those conditions are met. And this is just kind of like one example, like that is eminently more scalable and lower cost and easier to achieve between two interested parties than having to work through a financial intermediary and do, you know, analog contracting, analog escrow. Um, so like, that's just like one small example of like the amazing potential I think there is in DeFi. But, you know, the interesting thing about Web3 and DeFi and financial services is that they're both coming around at a time where you have like I was saying, a lot of funds with a lot of money chasing a larger, but like still roughly equal in size number of, you know, tangible opportunities. And so the prices in, you know, DeFi and Web3 have been just bid up over the last year. And you've seen a lot of funds kind of jumping in to, because there's a little bit of FOMO in the space and they don't want to miss out on this train. I'm a natural skeptic and I think that uh, the long-term potential for DeFi is all financial services, but in the short term, there's going to be some pain. There's not a clear regulatory regime for DeFi yet. Um, it's not entirely clear that the current financial services market, um, you know, which depending on which market you're talking about can be trillions of dollars, is ready to move their architecture over to a decentralized finance protocol without rigorous auditing and testing. Um, you know, uh, if you have an immutable ledger that's governing your transactions and somebody exploits it because they're able to find a bug, like there is not necessarily, uh, the same level of recourse that you have with reversible transactions on, you know, you know, analog financial service rails. All these are solvable problems. None of them is an existential problem that can't be overcome, but it'll take a while. Um, and so what I think is you have this huge rush of money into DeFi. Some of these products will play out. Many will have to pivot and you'll see some consolidation. That's like the matching of hopes to the matching of reality. And when those two come together, then you'll have really, really productive building um, because there will be a little bit more line of sight into what the next steps look like for DeFi um, and less like dispersion of outcomes. So that's like a really convoluted way of me saying, the fund is investing in DeFi. We've already backed a couple of great DeFi founders I'm really excited about. Um, in the DeFi space, we backed Paysale, which is building B2B payments on the Celo stablecoin. We've backed Goldfinch, which is building this decentralized protocol for lending in emerging markets through fintech companies that's already providing a ton of capital um, as debt liquidity to fintechs in different emerging markets. Um, and then the Web3 space, we backed three box, um, which is a lab that's building ceramic, which is, it sounds boring to say it, but I think ceramic is going to be the data architecture that underlies all of web three. Um, so it's a little bit like saying the backbone of the internet today. Um, that's what ceramic is going to be. So I'm extremely excited about, uh, these companies. Um, but I think that you have a lot of unsophisticated investors who are rushing in and just paying for anything DeFi, and that's going to create some short term pain. Um, because you really need to find teams that know what they're doing and that have an use case today that they can execute on um, because there are going to be some scaling challenges along the way. Yeah, no, that makes sense, Nick. And I think you're, yeah, I think you're, you're spot on. And it sounds like the focus has been on infrastructure, which at this stage makes the most sense, right? Without the infrastructure, all the other cool use cases can't come to fruition. Um, or, you know, it's much more challenging because you've got to build that. So it sounds like that's kind of the focus. And I feel like that's really where we, where we are, um, at least today, is those companies that are really building the infrastructure that will enable all of the really cool things and, and use cases that can come out of both DeFi and Web3 in general. So, um, yeah, thanks yeah, the, for, the, for going out uh, on a limb there. <laughs> the phrase going around is uh, mullets. Uh, fintech in the front, DeFi in the back. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I like that. I like that. So in terms of um, like this week in fintech, the fund, everything that you're doing, first off, I don't know how you manage it all. Um, plus, you know, full-time job with Google, like it's, it's a lot, but uh, I really respect that. But what does, what does the future look like when you think about um, where you envision everything coming together and, and like success for um, both the fund, the newsletter and the community? What does that really look like your long-term vision? Um, so, I, you know, it's, it's really bittersweet for me, but I am in the process of leaving Google, um, okay. it's been a fantastic organization and a great team to work with over the past couple of years. But in order for me to really, uh, dedicate the appropriate level of energy to this fund and everything with it, I need to focus on that full time. Um, what you're going to see over the next year is a relentless focus on community and developing the network. Um, that's really kind of the core superpower here is the strength of the fintech community um, and bridging all of those individual nodes together. I think you'll have a lot of, you know, cult like fund managers tell you, I have a vision of the future and it's the only right vision and you need to back me because you need to back my vision. Some of them are right. Uh, many of them are not right. Um, but like, I don't have the hubris to go out and say, I have the only vision of the future in fintech that you should listen to. Um, and so, you know, what you're not going to see over the next year is like one thesis for the future that is rigid and exclusive of anybody else's thesis. What you are going to see is as we develop like the best community in fintech, um, we bring together all the people who are building their visions and competing every single day to bring these products to the market. Um, and we'll back the ones who really have these like incredibly compelling visions and teams that they put together. Um, and that backing may be financial through the fund it may be advisory support, it may be consulting and maybe just making the right introductions to them. What we've been doing through the newsletter for a while now is we have like a set list of VCs who we know very well. We just say, anybody reach out to us and we're happy to ping these VCs if you want to connect to them. And if they double opt in, we'll make the connection happen. Um, and so, uh, you know, the relentless focus for the next year is going to be bridging all of those nodes in fintech. Um, because I think when you have this like global interconnected network, it's really incredible what you can achieve. And the network is a huge lever for, for scaling really quickly. Yeah, no, I love that. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're spot on. Um, well, what about for you? What's the next year look like for Ostrich? Yeah. Um, good question. I mean, you know, for us, it's been this real journey from like a, a, a product perspective, um, like I said, capital constraint. We've built things that didn't work, um, but this year we've got you know a lot of momentum. We've got pilots lined up on the B two B side. We've got um, some exciting things that we're doing on the consumer side. And really for us, it's figuring out what's the best route to market. Um, right? Is it going to be a B two B? Are we going to end up being a B two B company? Or are we going to end up being a consumer company? And I think long term we will ultimately end up in the consumer space for sure. But what's the best way for us to capture that? you know, global network and kind of what you talked about with, um, you know, you know, uh, the mullet, right. Um, you know, DeFi in the back, um, we're thinking about how can we long-term provide, you know, financial services, um, but only until we actually have built up the community and the network and have helped people and they're asking us to solve problems. So we've helping them invest and they want a quicker way to do it through our challenges and the community. And so, that's kind of our, our focus is really hitting our stride on that front. And, um, you know, now that we've got our new product out there, it's doubling down on, uh, on development and really finding that product market fit. Cause that's ultimately what we've got to accomplish. And so we've got some exciting things going on, but, you know, I think for, for us, that's, that's what I'm really excited about for, for this year. Um, awesome. Well, I'm excited to watch it. So thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. So Nick, this has been a, a lot of fun. Um, I'd like to end the conversations with um, a couple personal finance questions, obviously given what, what we do at Ostrich. Um, so if you're game, I've got, a, I've got a few quick ones for you. Oh man, let's do it. <laughs> All right. So how would you describe your relationship with money today? Um, you know, I didn't really have money for like most of the, honestly like adjusted for years, most of my life. You know, not that I grew up in like any kind of hard scrabble circumstances. My parents, you know, provided for my education and like, you know, were, were uh, well off themselves, but like they, you know, kind of instilled in me that like you need to live your life on a strict budget. 
So I didn't even have a credit card until I graduated from college. Uh, I had no idea that you could spend more on a credit card than you had in your bank account. Like that was just not an option that I was aware of. Um, and so I have always been incredibly conservative with money. Um, and I hope that that, you know, conservativeness is going to spill over into managing other people's money for the fund well as well. I love that. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, I, I was the same way. I didn't want to open up a credit card. I think it took me a while, like maybe my senior year in college before I finally, uh, I finally opened one up. Um, what would you say is the best investment that you've made, Nick? <laughs> uh, oh boy. Uh, it's not Dogecoin. Cool. <laughs> uh, oh man, this is gonna be such a corny answer, but um, I think, I think honestly, like the best investment that I made was in putting myself in an early stage startup where there was a lot of like learning by doing. There's so many different ways to learn that are really valuable, but like, being, you know, down in the wire in an early stage company is really a test in self-sufficiency and being comfortable with ambiguity and needing to figure things out yourself. Um, without developing that comfort and that self-reliance, like I wouldn't be a good financial investor. I wouldn't be a good, you know, emerging fund manager. I, I just wouldn't really have the life skills that I need to uh, go out and like build something myself and be a contrarian. So it's not a financial investment per se, but I think joining an early stage startup is really instrumental to anybody's career in tech and everybody should do it. Yeah, I love that. it's not corny, right? If it's, if, it's, if it's true, then it's true, right? I find that most of the really good investments tend not to be uh, monetary ones, right? Because you, know, you can get lucky once, but you know, when, you, mm -hmm. when you invest in yourself, as you said, you're gonna be able to take those learnings from your time in early stage startups and apply that in perpetuity. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like the question, like, is it better to be uh, lucky or right? Um, and I think the answer kind of depends. And it's like, if you're playing a one shot game, like lucky is great. You get lucky, you maximize, you cash out, and you're done. If you're playing a repeat game, which is what life is and what careers are, like it's better to be right. Even if you don't get lucky, like having the right priors will eventually pay off. The person who depends too much on like being lucky once you know, they join an early stage startup one time and it takes off and, you know, they don't really feel the need to develop themselves because they're at such a successful company. Like eventually like that luck flattens out. And then that's when you really find that you wish you'd invest in yourself more. Yeah. It's a great insight. Now on the flip side though, Nick, we don't always make good decisions. So what would you say is the dumbest money mistake you've made or one? It doesn't have to be the dumbest, but uh, one that sticks <laughs> out. I've made so many dumb money moves before. Um, oh man, that's such a good question. You know, I, I, okay, okay. Th th this is like, hopefully this resonates with whoever's listening to this podcast, but like, like everybody else, I experienced terrible FOMO in late 2017 and piled into crypto um, and bought everything at, you know, all time highs. And then, you know, in early 2018 it was just like totally washed out. And I, you know, it was like everybody else. I was like, I got, you know, we're all going to be rich. We're all going to retire. And then, you know, saw all of that wash away. And it was humbling, but it was like uh, a great lesson for me to say, like, are your fundamentals right? Like, do you have the right, like a priori reasoning for why you're getting into this? Like, can you be strong enough to avoid FOMO? Um, and so, you know, we saw this huge run up in crypto valuations over the last year, but I think like the avoid FOMO um, has helped me be a little bit more thoughtful about it, uh, yeah. being an investor. I think that's, yeah, that's a great insight. I hope you didn't cash out and you stayed in crypto because if you had, you know, if you did, it ended up working out in the long run, right? So. I, yeah, I did it because I was like, we're at the bottom. Like there's nothing for me to get by cashing out. So I was happy to see things retrace. But, you know, I think one of the best skills you can have as an investor is know that when you're at the all-time highs, like they'll come back down and you can be okay with that. And know that when you're at the lows, it'll come back up and you just have to wait. Like patience is really the key. Yeah, I love that. And then Nick, any, any advice for whether it's founders or someone that's early on in their career or fund managers, any kind of like personal finance advice that you've got um, that you wish you would have known or something that you're thinking about actively now? I'd say be open to every form of feedback that you can get. But if you trust yourself, don't let it change the fundamental premises that you've built yourself and your ideology on. Uh, starting anything, as you know, at Ostrich means that you will have a hundred people tell you why you're wrong and it can't be done. And I would say, be open to that feedback, 
take it with a smile, thank people who tell you you're wrong, ask them for more feedback, incorporate it into you know, your framework that you have for understanding the world, but then believe in yourself and execute on the vision that you have for yourself. Um, and you know, that kind of hardiness and resiliency, I think is the most important aspects to anything that you seek out to do. Yeah, I love that. Nick, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you sitting down. If there's any other final words or you know requests from the audience, I know you mentioned a couple things around looking for editors and I believe you said Africa and the Middle East, um, but if there's anything in particular um, that you've got to ask from the audience. And then um, please let everyone know how they can connect with you outside of this podcast. Yeah, no, William, thanks you, thank you so much for having me on. It's been, uh, you know, everybody likes getting asked questions about themselves, but um, you're a great interviewer. Um, I'm a really big fan of the Silicon Alley podcast and I appreciate you having me on it. Um, anybody can always connect with me at, on Twitter. My DMs are <laughs> too open. <laughs> uh, and uh, my handle's at Nick Milanovic. But uh, I hope we get a chance to talk again because this has been really fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll have to get together in in person. And I'm. When you, I know you mentioned the uh, the event last year, the formal. Um, I had a conflict. Otherwise, I would have loved to have uh, to have been there. So we'll uh, we'll definitely have to get together in person in the city too. Yeah, man. Send your talks to the cleaners. We'll see you next year. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Thanks, Nick. Have a good one. On your way out, please share the podcast with others. It's the only way that the community grows and others hear these incredible stories from entrepreneurs and top performers. And of course, pound that subscribe button so you get notified when episodes drop every Friday. I'm William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and of course, your host of the Silicon Alley Podcast. Have a very profitable day. You got no time to waste, but still you hesitate. Caught in a circle saying I'll never